Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to this uh, Mental Health Professional Network um, broadcast, talking tonight about navigating mental health challenges when living with physical disability. Um, we have, I think, a couple of hundred participants joining us this evening, and hopefully some people are with others so that they can share the learning in small groups. Uh, and also, for those of you who are watching the recording, uh, further down the track, we welcome you as well. MHPN would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, seas and waterways across Australia, upon which all our webinar presenters and participants are located. We wish to pay respect to Elders past, present and future for the memories, the traditions, the culture and the hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australia. I'm on Wurundjeri country in Nam, in Carlton, in Nam. So my name's Steve Trumbull, and I'll be facilitating tonight's session, which is a little bit different to the webinars that we usually have in that there's no case for us to discuss tonight. It is all about responding to your questions and having a conversation between the members of the panel that we've put together for you tonight. I'm a GP, and over 20 years ago now, I wrote a doctoral thesis on healthcare for people with developmental disabilities, uh, and mental health was a very large part of that. The psychiatrist had pretty much grabbed the whole field, but we're not really talking about developmental disabilities tonight as much as acquired disabilities, as will become clear as we go through. But so GP by background, but my current role is the head of medical education at Melbourne Medical School. You did receive the uh, panellist biographies with the invitation, so we won't go through that in detail, but we would like to introduce you to them. Uh, so there they are. We'll start with um, Glenn Bedwell. Now, Glenn, you're in Queensland and you have lived experience of disability. Can you tell us, though, about your peer support role and what this entails? Sure thing, Steve. Um, I joined a amputee support group by the name of Limbs for Life a number of years ago. Uh, Limbs for Life is based in Melbourne. It covers Australia and New Zealand. Um, it, as the name suggests, it is a it is a amputee support group providing information to amputees, um, obviously primarily new amputees, but also supporting amputees through NDIS, etc. And um, information in that direction. Uh, a few years ago, I volunteered to become a peer support volunteer with them and did, uh, did a, a bit of a day's training on, on what words to use and not use. Uh, what happens now is um, a, new a new amputee, sorry, maybe in hospital or their family quite often, or doctor, nursing staff, etc., contacts Limbs for Life and, and asks whether there's anybody that has been through this process and um, could possibly come and visit. So um, during COVID, it was all done via telephone, unfortunately, which is difficult. But, uh, but now I might get a phone call or an email um, asking me to go and visit a, a new amputee who may be in hospital uh, or may be about to become an amputee and, and wishes to talk to somebody other than a medical staff. So you, um, I go along and just, just talk to them about how they feel about what's going on. Um, try to show them um, that mobility is still possible. Um, tell them what I've done with my life since becoming an amputee so that they, um, they are better understanding that a, that a good um, working life is possible, depending upon their reputation, of course, um, and provide that sort of support along with um, a lot of uh, documentation that Limbs for Life provides uh, to also assist them. That's great, Glenn. We're really looking forward to hearing what sort of questions you get asked. I'm sure there must be topics that come up all the time, particularly relating to mental health. So we look forward to hearing from you a lot tonight. So thanks for joining us. Next, I'd like to introduce uh, Walter Rayner, who is also from Victoria, as I am, Glenn's in Queensland. Uh, she's a guest psychotherapist and the carer of a family member with a disability. Walter, can you tell us how you see art playing a role in helping people who live with a disability? Well, um, thank you and good evening, everyone. Art for me was my saviour 25 years ago when the disability happened in our house. And if I wouldn't have had art, 
when I was on the brink of with very, very uh, many suicidal thoughts and the fine line between staying and going was something which became familiar to me, which you know effectively then pushed me into um, therapy myself and becoming a therapist. And the appreciation I gained um, of my own healing and expression, what art allowed me at the time to do, because words weren't available to me. Um, therapy the therapeutic support wasn't really available what I needed and art allowed me a platform to express myself to be heard to be witnessed to be and I felt seen and because of that personal experience and the power of transformation which I only ex took five days for me to experience to go back into the house and cope again and deal with what I had to deal with became then very much a focus in my uh, life and how I was working and how I used art, um, textile threads in order to provide a space for people to express themselves. Thanks, Gottfried. And I'll definitely be asking you whether art is for everyone uh, or whether there are some people who don't find it the um, the support and comfort that you did. So I'm sure we'll come to that as we work through um, the group's questions. Thank you for joining us tonight. That's great. The next person I'd like to introduce you all to is Katrina Pacey, who is in Queensland. She's an occupational therapist. Um, so obviously working in rural and remote areas quite a bit. Katrina, uh, as an OT, how can it be different in rural and remote areas for people living with a disability? Oh, I'm not hearing Katrina. You're muted. Okay, somebody has. Heard Katrina. There's my there's my my technical error for the night. Um, <laughs> tonight. Well done. <laughs> the, probably the the biggest difference, Steve, is the most obvious one, and that's the different the distance. Um, the impact of distance is felt fairly systemically in the lives of people from rural and remote areas. It impacts on access to services, um, the feeling of things being private and confidential. Um, it doesn't, I, there's not necessarily less professional services in country areas, but knowing that someone doesn't actually know you makes you feel safe that you're in information is safe and, and secure. Um, the distance in the bush also impacts on the need to travel for services, timeframes between which services are able to be accessed and the support that service providers themselves might have access to. Um, they might often feel isolated themselves. But there's definite benefits as well. Um, the closeness of community can be a really great positive factor in the lives of people who experience disability in the bush um, and the practical capabilities of the people that surround a person with a disability um, and the, the realism. I, optimism is a great thing, but being realistic in terms of outcomes and still having hope is a marvellous thing and um, people in the country tend to be very practical. They've had to make do with what they've got for most of their lives. Mm. I saw a very practical um, example of that just a couple of weeks ago up in Darwin where there's a ferry that goes across to uh, service a community on the far side of the bay there and it looks very convenient until you realise that the tides mean that whereas you can roll straight off the ferry onto the wharf in the morning, in the afternoon you've got to go down I think five flights of steps and as the nursing staff put it to me there, people just can't go to Darwin if they're in a wheelchair across the ferry. They've got to go a couple of hours around the bottom by road. So really practical issues. But as you say, the dichotomy of distance in the bush being huge but emotionally quite close is, uh, is really mm. important. Thanks for that. So we'll be hearing a lot from you tonight as well, I'm sure. And finally, uh, we have Chris Baston, who's in New South Wales, a psychologist, clinical psychologist. So, Chris, what's one of the first discussions you have with a client who's just acquired a physical disability? Um, nice question. I start by asking questions to get to know them. I'll make it very clear that I want to find out things about them before their illness or injury or accident. 
Um, and and it might feel to the client like just a bit of a chat and that I'm interested in them. But I'm as a clinician, I'm hearing out for listening out for things like what have they lost? What they had before means that's what they've lost. And then we're going to talk about that. But also I want to find out about their personal characteristics that might have endured, um, their strengths that we're going to be tapping into, who's around them, social supports are vital, um, and what efforts to adapt they have already adopted. Um, so, yeah, I, I tend to start with what we might as clinicians call, you know, taking a pre-morbid history, but it's really just about I just want to get to know you is what it should sound like with a client. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks for that. So we've got plenty to talk about tonight. They've, we've received lots of questions, which are fabulous. Now, we're not going to have a short discipline specific presentation tonight because there's no case for us to discuss, as I mentioned. But I do want to take us through the learning outcomes. So if we go to the next slide, these are really important. Through an exploration of mental health impacts on those living with physical disability, their carers and family, the webinar will provide participants with the opportunity to, and I should stress there that we are throwing the envelope here around all those people who are affected by the physical disability, the person themselves, but also those who uh, are in their family in particular, as well as those of you who work professionally uh, with people who have a physical disability. But uh, hopefully we'll give you the opportunity to describe the general principles of providing a safe and supportive environment for people living with disability, their carers and family, if they do experience mental health challenges. We're also going to um, work tonight to make sure that you can outline key principles in providing appropriate therapies and communication approaches to people living with disability, their carers and family, if they experience mental health challenges. And finally, we would like you to have a bit of a think and identify challenges, think of some tips and some strategies to build appropriate referral pathways and to implement a collaborative response to assist people living with disability, their carers and family who may be experiencing mental health challenges. So that's our goal tonight, but really very much what we do is going to be driven by you and your questions. Um, we have had a number of questions come through before the seminar. So I think if we just go to the next slide. There we are. We'll just have that up. Uh, that reminds you how to, oh gosh, we're a very happy, friendly looking bunch, aren't we? Um, that reminds you how to ask a question, but we do have a few questions to get us started with that came up with uh, the pre-seminar submissions. And I think I might start with Chris Baston, our clinical psychologist, just to sort of um, let us have some indication of the scope of what we're talking about tonight. And Chris, are there any psychological challenges that are common across the wide spectrum of different disabilities? Well, yes, I think there are. I mean, it's so broad, really, um, but we can make some commonalities. Um, one of the challenges or one of the common experiences is sadness. It's the emotion that we have in response to loss. But the, the real challenge for a lot of people is to legitimise their own sadness. You know, the number of times I do psychoeducation about how it's okay to feel sorry for yourself, um, people find that really hard, and how to do that in, a, in an adaptive way and why that's very different from sitting around feeling sorry for yourself in, in, a, in a negative way. Another one is staying connected with others, keeping relationships close and middle range. And then the big tasks that come, for most people, the big commonality um, across the board would be readjusting one's self-worth and readjusting identity. So I think they're the big ones. I'm sure others will find more as well uh, when they think about their caseload. Okay, well, thanks for that. So a sense of loss is obviously very important and understandable. I would imagine that Glenn and then maybe Walter is very well placed to talk about their experiences of disability and also working professionally in the area. What you see is commonly coming up with people who have experienced disability, either themselves or as a family member, uh, and what comes up in your conversations with them. Glenn, what are your thoughts? Yeah, um Shock, I guess, is the first one that that that, that hits hits the um, 
it's an amputee. Um, uh, in, in my case, it's a little bit different because um, uh, they tried to save my leg for a month and then I, uh, then I had a cardiac, uh, I extenuated, I lost all my blood. Um, so when I, when they saved me and I had been amputated, um, I had no memory of the accident I'd been involved with or the month that I'd been in hospital. So it was sort of uh, waking up without a leg and having no idea why. Um, certainly at the, uh, initially it's the uh, body issues, um, loss of self-esteem. Once you, once you, you sort of get out of hospital and you get home, um, at, at, total um, reduction or in income, major increase in expenses. Um, I, was, I was the breadwinner. Um, uh, loss of career potential, um, which, is, uh, which, which is a hard thing to swallow. Um, it moved on to difficulty and to exercise, so you tend to put on weight, so you even uh, get more greater loss of self-esteem um, and just learning how to cope with life and and, and the changes uh, uh, each and every day, multiple times you go to do something quite easily that you used to be able to do and you suddenly realise you can't do it that way anymore and you have to find new ways. So, yeah, just almost everything in life is a challenge at first. So, well, look, thanks for that, Glenn. And you've actually touched on a couple of issues that have come up in questions from the participants already. Uh, Jane Rossiter and uh, Amelia Peterson, I think, have asked um, uh, some questions, I guess, which is about getting people or when is the right time to start getting involved with people, particularly looking at mental health aspects of disability. Uh, you've said that early on there was the valiant struggle to save your leg. Um, uh, Jane just raised the issue about um, the, the focus on rehabilitation, recovery of previous functioning early on is about, uh, I guess, holding on to the hope for recovery or reversal of some sort. When do people then move to accepting that this is the way they're going to be? I think I was fairly lucky in the sense of it was very obvious uh, once once I became once I became a, an amputee it was very obvious to me um, okay you know things are going to change somewhat um, uh, I, I was fairly well driven that I wish to uh, retain a good life and and all that sort of thing so um, I, I was I pushed myself certainly. Um, I, I attempted to get, and I did actually get back to work um, in a very short space of time. I guess uh, all those years ago, I didn't have to do things like uh, have a medical clearance to return to work like you would nowadays. Um, what but, sort of work were you doing, Glenn? Is that of interest? Um, I was managing an airline in uh, in Cairns in North Queensland. Okay. I, uh, like I said, you know, my, my career had been mapped out. Um, I'd already visited the, the, the next uh, airports that I was being, uh, the suggestion was that I'd been going to, and I'd been to London, Tokyo and uh, Singapore, but that all changed and I lost my leg. Um, so that, that was, that, that's the psychological part that was probably rather difficult to, to deal with at the time. Just mm -hmm. to think that your life, uh, your chosen career path has been taken away. What about you, Walter? You've indicated that it's now been 25 years since disability arrived in your family. Um, what's your recollection or what do you see professionally in those happening in those early days? Look, this is such a great question and this is how I actually wanted to answer it. It depends, <laughs> it depends on the um, timing of, of beginning middle and it seems to be for some people there's no end like my husband is still in therapy today um, he has been on and off but he has access to that he is a, a paraplegic he's had a, a injury which resulted in paraplegia um, t11 and 12 quite high up and what i am hearing um glenn saying I am very much seeing what happened for him. He had the support. I am here today very much with the carer's hat. 
And I like to put a voice to the people affected, family, partners, children, and how they get affected and how little support there was. And I I feel still is. There's an early um, shock, okay, we, we're going to bring you lots and lots of soups, lots of pies and lots of stuff turns up at crisis in front of the door. You can't even eat, eat and freeze as what kind people bring you. And then all of a sudden, three months down the road, six months down the road, all this dries up and disappears. And you are supposedly should cope as a carer. And by then, um, the support needed for a carer, a mother, or the children, or the father, depending also who is the affected person in the household. Is it the father? Is it the mother? Is it we both were working? I became the care, uh, the care, the carer overnight for the whole house, dogs and kids, and my husband, and also I uh, had this burden. I am now the, the caretaker and the income provider, and that took four years for us to sort out, and resulted in deep depression for both of us at the end of those four years. Mm -hmm. So I feel that help is needed at, at the beginning to help you over the shock to, so you don't stop breathing. And then definitely when the depression sets in and when everybody has left the boat, even the rats and the mice, you need to be called back in. How are you doing? doing Thanks so much for that, Walter. I'm going to go to Katrina or Chris now. Chris, I saw you nodding your head when uh, I think it was Walter had referred to everything dropping away after a certain number of weeks. Is this something that services need to actively prepare for, that, that uh, lull after the initial um, frenzy of activity? Yes, I've heard that so many times, and Walter just described that beautifully firsthand. Um, so many people say that um, there's a rush of support, um, and it also reminds me of another commonality: is that a lot of really well-meaning family and friends they don't they want to help, but they don't quite know how. And one of the most common little bits of advice I might try to give somebody is to help people to help you. So let them know. It's like, please don't give me any food now, but I'd love a phone call in two months. You know, be, be really directive. I know that's a bit too simple, uh, simplistic perhaps, but I have heard that a lot before and that's why I was nodding. What about you, Katrina? Is that something that you're familiar with in your service? Yeah, it's it, it doesn't hit me firsthand. However, I know that um, we often become involved with people after they after they've been through the hospital system, they're back home in community, and um, and the the role of the private occupational therapist is to identify for the NDIS the services that people most need. And something that we have to be really careful of is to not. Um, not colour what the information that we provide too much with the wonderful informal supports that are around a person because the NDIS can grab hold of that and it's it's um, it's awesome for people to have informal support, but informal support is not a guarantee, and we we just need to be very careful that we write in what people need and identify what people need. If informal supports were not available, if the if the neighbour has a bad day or goes on holidays or um, their son comes to live with them and they can no longer provide the, the support that they've been providing, how is the person going to manage if there aren't formal supports available? So there's actually a question that's come in um, from Michelle Butler, who I think is down in the Latrobe Valley. 
And she's asked, I guess relating to that is about accessing services. And it's a very practical question. I think we should probably think about it um, early on in the conversation, which is about what do you write as the primary disability in somebody who's got a mental health issue and a physical disability? Um, very practical question. Uh, do we put down or how do we not game the system, but how do we get quickest service for our clients? Mm. Well, there's a couple of questions in that question. So the quickest service is the one that's most available and we might not know what that is but in terms of what do you write as the disability bear in mind that there can be times when planners who do the work for the ndis will grab hold of the primary disability and only fund what is listed as the primary disability if someone has a physical disability that is the impairment that is going to cost them the most. So I would write the physical disability and then include the mental, the mental disability, the mental illness or the mental ill health as a secondary disability and really make sure that it is included on there, the impact on function. Um, the NDIS is not about um, providing things that treat or heal somebody's impairment, it is all about addressing function. So if the, if the mental um, ill health of someone as a result or in addition to a physical disability is stopping them from accessing the local shops and is stopping them from completing a task such as caring for their child or um, stopping them from, from actively engaging in employment in the community, then those are the things that the NDIS will address and it must be addressed in a report in terms of function. Okay, thanks. That, that's great to have that dealt with. There's a question that was submitted before the broadcast that I'm keen for us to also address quite early on, which was that mental health services are by and large talking cures. They're the ones that work best. Um, but there are some people with disability who are nonverbal. I was wondering what the group's thoughts were about your challenges, your successes in providing services, mental health support to people who struggle with speech? Come on. I'm happy to speak to that. Oh, well, Trent. Have you, have you worked with people who are nonverbal? Uh, as a matter of fact, I have a, a client in this very uh, moment for about a year now. Um, he suffered a stroke. Uh, three years ago was in rehab for a year and now and has he's always been interested in in uh, suiting like he used to make shirts and he wanted to be engaged in some sort of uh, creative endeavors in order to find another way of earning money and he is learning how to make hats because in my former life, uh, my very first occupation from the age of 25 onwards, I have been a milliner and I have and travel also rural country in order to provide hat making. And this client has found very much that this, for him this has become a therapy because he can't sit and talk about his issues, but he can use this in hat making. And in hat making, there's many different techniques. You might be using a sandpaper, you might be using Stanley knives and scissors and, and colors and wire and steam and, and you pull it and you work it. So he has an ability to express his emotions into the material. And several days and several hours, we have um, tears running down his face because it releases something. And he, the, the touch and the tactileness he can uh, access with the material and then having a finished product because he actually is having, he has taken to it like a duck to water. There's an outcome and he's starting to make money from it. He's selling the products. So it's very much a an expressive tool which does not need words. 
All right. Thanks for that. Are there any other thoughts from the, the panel about experiences you've had working with people who do not communicate through um, through speech? I can probably answer a little bit. Just from my own experience, um, much of my my experience as an OT has been with adults with intellectual impairment and um, and very limited access to communication. So, first things first, don't don't assume that. Um, you can't know what someone's communicating when they don't have words to say um, and and stay very, very open to learning. Um, you need to observe the person and allow space, not, not space for speech, but space to allow a person to look with intent or to, um, to make a movement so that you can see where their interests lie. Um, learn from the people around the person because they're with them all the time. They know what every little grunt or groan or, or movement of the body means. And if there's a speech pathologist involved, please do talk to the speechy. Um, they're, it's exactly what they're trained to do to determine what what form of communication system is going to work best for this person and how can we make that accessible to them and to the world around them. Great. Thanks for that. I must say, speaking as a GP, probably the most challenging moment of my whole career was many years ago when a young man asked via his mother for me to kill him because he had cerebral palsy and mm. he didn't want to go on. And he communicated by a communication board that his mother sort of interpreted. Uh, that was an incredibly difficult thing. But the thing I really remember from that is the the smell of despair, the cortisol seeping through his pores of how distressed he was. Uh, it uh, it's something as a GP that I realised there are lots of other senses open to us to try to understand what's going on for somebody who was just in such a terrible place in his life at that time and have to do that through his mother was an incredibly challenging thing for him. Chris, I've I've given you an almost impossible lead in to follow there. What were you going to say? Uh, I had some thoughts, but Katrina said nearly all of them and said them better than me. I, that's right. There are, I've found and I've learnt through supervision that there are non-verbal ways to communicate. There's lots of non-talking forms of communication. And I also learnt the hard way to be patient. You know, if somebody's got a dysarthria or a speech, but they can speak a little bit, is to just give them lots of time to have a go, have two goes, have three goes, or to write it out. And you just give and have the time. Sometimes it helps to have somebody else in the room. Uh, but I agree with Katrina's thrust um, and what Trudz is to um, find, you know, if, if we're open to, to uh, opportunities, we'll find ways to help aid communication. And I think you've hit upon one of our potentially top tips for this evening, Chris, which is about the importance of continuing to focus on the person, even if they're accompanied by somebody who might be assisting with speech, to be able to continue speaking directly to and listening to the person who is struggling with speech, but who deserves that human respect of that um, direct uh, consultation rather than um, trying to do healthcare via satellite, which really doesn't work all that well. Actually, um, Walter, you mentioned when we were chatting last week that there was an app, I think, that uses QR codes that you're familiar with, which can help people lead others to a page which explains their communication preferences? What? Y yes. <clears throat> There's uh, two resources. One actually is uh, being developed in Queensland, and that one is called Search, uh, C-E-R-G-E, -E, with an uh, apostrophe on top. <clears throat> and, um, and the other one, I speak to that one first, it's a it's a quite a new app, and it depends on the uptake of uh, people, of course. And the you you have this on your phone, and you can you have to get shops involved. There's some shops in Queensland because it's a Queensland app who are involved. There's not that many down here in Victoria, and it's up to anyone with a disability or who is on this webinar, for example, who could next time say to the shop, you know, in the shops they go to, do you actually use this app? And if not, why not? 
it allows the person with a disability and who has special needs to call ahead by pressing a button and it will announce that they are arriving and what their, their needs are in order to shop in that particular establishment. The other card is the National um, Assistance Card. It comes out of Hobart. And that is a card that costs money, about $45 or something like that. You get that card uh, to that card attached is a web page. People can access by taking the Q card, the Q code, R Q code of the card. And, and that will then allow the person who owns the card to, to put down what they want people to know. You know, I, I can speak, don't walk away. I can't speak, but I understand everything. Don't walk away. I'm happy to conversation. I make hats. I do this. I cut hair here. You can, uh, you can um, get in contact with me. So whatever information they want to put up there will be there. And, and that's a way for them to communicate without having to have somebody else there interpreting for them. That's great, well, Trent, and I suspect you would probably um, resonate with Gail Pemberton, who's put a question there about sand play therapy and saying that sand play uh, is a great way of people who are nonverbal being able to express what feelings they might be having, even though what they're actually expressing might not be immediately apparent to the, the therapist, but for the person who's putting a structure into the sand tray that is meaningful to them, as would be a hat or whatever it might be the person's making. Oh, very much so. And on that point, if I um, may, please, those kind of therapy, like sand play um, therapy or play therapy or, or weaving or um, art therapy, Alexander techniques, uh, uh, they are all therapies which once upon a time, and for some therapies still today, are voodoo therapies. You know, they kind of haven't got really, they glaze, uh, often the mental health field glazes over when they hear tapping or Alexander techniques or drumming or sound healing. All those voodoo therapies were for me a lifesaver. If I wouldn't have had them in my pocket back then, I don't know what would have become of me. Now, those voodoo, some of them like tapping, EMDR, they all have become very scientifically researched uh, modalities and are very useful. And, and we often say the therapist has to, can only take the patient as far they have gone themselves. I kind of would like to invite therapists who are here, health professionals, to do a little workshop, to try it out, to see what this is about, um, to have a sand play therapy for a weekend or to do a drumming workshop or to an, engage in an art therapeutic space because something will, it is a visceral understanding and it, it's not a textbook um, trying to learn a technique. Great. Thanks for that. There's certainly a broad range of things out there. And as I think we mentioned earlier, it's a matter of finding what best suits the person. Mm. Speaking of which, there have been a couple of questions coming up about the range of disabilities and whether each of you might use a different approach. For example, if you're talking with somebody who has a congenital disability rather than an amputation or a spinal cord transection, but was born with a condition and they don't know life without that condition, does that alter our therapeutic approach? And how early in a person's life do we start to talk to them about mental health when they've either acquired or have a congenital disability which is impacting on them? This is open to anybody. Chris, Katrina, Glenn, Walter? Well, I can jump in there immediately because um, as it so happens, again, it depends obviously on age. And my darling grandchild, who is two years old, she was born with extra and polydactyl syndrome um, for the ones who don't know what that means is uh, she had too many fingers and not enough toes. And so she had some amputated fingers and one they had to amputate to a little stump. 
And she, a little trooper as she is, she would carry on as normal. And she's now two. And four weeks ago, all of a sudden, she stood and looked at her hands and she went, oh, baby, baby finger. And she named it. She noticed it for the first time. She named it. And now this is the baby finger. So I think at the beginning, it is, again, watching the developmental needs. Where are they at? What, do they, what, what does the affected person, in that case, the child, what are they dealing with? And the parents, they already need support. Like in my case, they knew during the pregnancy this was going to happen, which was so they had time to process. Some parents don't have time to process because it is a shock, just as a an accident or an acquired uh, injury people have to deal with. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the needs again, there's the family need and then there's the need for a child. And there is, thanks God, literature out there now. There's children books, which we, we in my age did not have available when my children needed it because they were five and eight. And now I have children books for my grandchild I can sit with and she can look and identify with different disabilities. So what about Katrina and Chris? Do either of you work with children and do you have a sort of a, an early age that you start to be concerned about mental health in a child with a, a disability? Uh, do you want to go first, Chris? Um, happy for you, Sue, Katrina. Thank you. <laughs> I think um, it, it, it really it depends so much on the child, but the um, I remember this little guy who um, we were asked to work with him because he he had some real behavioural challenges at the daycare centre. Um, where he was going and mum and dad were starting to get concerned but the um when he was when he was two he had open heart surgery and the the types of behavioral challenges that we were seeing were things like um lots of difficulty paying attention lots of difficulty following instruction not being able to sit still and when we observed him he was he was incredibly hypervigilant. So it made it very difficult to be close to other children. So, for example, on mat time, made it very difficult for him to stay still if a teacher approached him and got down on his level so that they could speak to him when he didn't look like he was paying attention. And I, in reality, the he gave every appearance of being of being a very happy child, but he displayed traits of very high levels of anxiety. And when we looked at the, the impact on open heart surgery, he was taken to a strange place by people who he trusted. Um, he was, he was, he woke up in a strange place surrounded by people he didn't know. And, um, and it was all because people he trusted put him there. So I think it, it depends so greatly on the child and the family and the supports around them. But the, we we look for what's what's going on. Like, are there behavioural indicators that say, hey, the, this child or this young person or this adult really needs some support? Okay, thanks for that. Chris, you've now had time to Google your response. What are you going to say? <laughs> Thank goodness, that's right. Um, well, yes, generally, a good rule of thumb is that the younger the age of onset, the, the easier it is for adjustment as a general rule of thumb. Um, so, for instance, a new, you know, a new acquired injury when you're 15 and you've got all of the demands and tasks of adolescence is very different from being born with the same thing. However, we do also find if somebody's got a congenital or early um, you know, infant onset issue, when they do become adolescents, it might finally rear its head. 
And we do tailor, I think most people would tailor their interventions. You might use roughly the same approach, but the intervention would alter. So classically, for a younger child, we would intervene a lot with the parents and make sure that they're giving the right verbal and nonverbal messages to the kid about their self-worth and their identity and all the things they can do. It should be about ability, messaging about ability, not disability. How do you convey that to your child in everyday actions? You don't have to tell them. You live it out. And then give kids little pithy, developmentally appropriate sentences so they can understand what's going on for them and share it with a friend and just get it over and done with for little ease. And the older the person, yes, the you would tailor that and maybe the intervention would become more individual and more sophisticated. Right. Actually, so, can I can I add to that, Stephen? Um, the I worked with a a young guy. He was ten when we started working with him, and he's a he's a young fellow with a fairly mild form of CP. Um, but one of the things when he came to us was he wanted to be able to to explain his disability um, and to to deal with the depression and anxiety that he was experiencing because he was different to his peers and. Um, that was that was an eye opener for me because I had assumed that having grown up with CP and he was a, a very high functioning young man, um, he was an athlete who regularly went away for eight hundred meter events. He's been to the the junior um, para Olympics. Um, he's he's he does a lot of amazing things that other kids his age will never get the opportunity to do, but. Um, but he's, he was experiencing all of these um, emotions about being different and not looking or feeling the same as his peers. Mm. Look, that, that sense of otherness is just so important. It reminded me of another patient of mine from many years ago, a young man with a disability who used to self-mutilate. He would take biros and just hack away at his forearms and his mother was forever bringing him in for me to bandage up his forearms while these gouges healed. And I had no idea what was going on until eventually his father brought him in and his father was home from the Merchant Navy and he had tattoos up each forearm. And this kid wanted to be like his dad. So for the first and probably the only time in my life, I medically prescribed a tattoo for this young man because that's what he wanted. It was uh, another one who wanted a pea plate like his brothers had pea plates. That was part of the rite of passage of turning 18 in Victoria. Um, and uh, he was quite happy once he had a pea plate on his um, large truck, which is how he got around. Uh, because that for him was a rite of passage. It took us a while to figure that out. It was only when he went into uh, a nearby pub and smashed the windows of all the cars with red peas on them, which is not a good strategy. He was communicating that he actually wanted to be like others of his age, and that was his distress. Glenn, do you ever go and visit people? Like I'm thinking of a child who might have a, an amputation due to meningococcus or something like that. Really can't help you with that, Steve. No, I haven't had any experience with that at all. Sorry. Are there are there um, child or junior members of your group who do go? Uh, for yes, there are, and, and that's that's part of what Limbs for Life try and do is match up male for male, uh, age group, similar amputation, etc. So <laughs> there's not a hope in hell they're going to send me to see a child. I'm a little bit older than that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, it's always a bit confronting when you realise that a younger person sees people of our age as being just impossibly remote and distant and would never want to grow up like us. That's yeah, fair enough. We speak the same language, yeah. Maybe um, I can offer a, another tool what I uh, have worked with when uh, there is a person with a disability and I would have benefited from is now uh, with family meetings, not family therapy to actually call them family meetings. Bring the family, the whole family, identify who is in the family. That could be chosen family, um, brothers and sisters and partners and uh, a friend. And uh, 
a coach that, act as a coach, as the therapist, for about five or six meetings and provide space and to tease out that everyone gets a chance to speak about their feelings, where the feelings can be um, respectfully be held just the way you asked the panel or to ask us all at the beginning, to have that within the, the whole family, to give voice to the ambiguous loss. And I did not understand about ambiguous loss, which is not just for the person has lost things. The carers have lost things, the children, the friends. We And the losses, they keep coming in waves because those losses are permanent. If you have a wheelchair in a house, you will never furnish the house the way you want to furnish the house. This is lost forever. You can see a chair there, but you can't put it there because the wheelchair can't get past. Um, and so it would be for children. And by providing that space as a family, one can tease that out and more will come out earlier than over the years where everybody has to fight for themselves. Thanks for that, Waltred. And Glenn, just hearing Waltred mention the chair there, I think when we were chatting last week, you mentioned that going into a wheelchair immediately rendered you deaf and mute and that you were no longer part of conversations. Everything went literally over your head. Uh, that must Absolutely. have been. Absolutely. I'm, I'm down there and the people we'd meet in the street would talk to my wife and ask her how I am. Um, and because we weren't on eye to eye, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a weird situation. But I must say as well, and, and on top of everything else, something that has always struck me is um, uh, the person with the disability gets everything pushed towards them or, or you know, they, they get assisted all the way through. In many respects, um, the family get left behind, um, especially uh, mental health. Um, I know my, my wife suffered something severe um, and nobody recognised that for a long time. And I'm sure my two sons did as well. Yeah. What do you think was the basis of their issue? If it's not too, it might be too personal to talk about tonight, but do you uh, have a general thought where those feelings arise from? I, I, I think, well, it was, um, as far as my wife's concerned, obviously it was a, um, a redistribution of family responsibilities um, uh, that was unplanned, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, she went from, uh, we went from making joint decisions on anything even reasonably important to, uh, to her having to man manage everything. And of course, also the physical with the, with the kids and that sort of thing that I couldn't do, um, for, you know, for a long time. So there was, you know, it was a big burden on her shoulders. And of course, um, she's trying to remain strong for me and strong for our two sons and, and, and hiding all of that from me. So that, that had a, a, a mental torture on her. So how, how do we expand our therapeutic umbrella, if you like, to cover um, the whole family? I mean, GPs are meant to be considered family practitioners, but uh, it's sort of hard to know, I would have thought, how far you can spread that. And I know, Katrina, in another conversation, you were talking about getting the whole community involved, but obviously not to the point that it makes those um, pavement conversations difficult and awkward in a smaller community. How do we balance that able to engage with the whole family while not, uh, and about their mental health, um, while not overstepping our bounds and our focus on our particular client. Yeah. You've, got, you've got to take care of the patient, but you've got to be aware that the, the patient's got family and friends around them and, and, and they've got to be, I guess, educated um, with regard to the situation along with the patient. Mm. If I can speak from a carer's hat and also from a, with a, a therapist's hat, it's about us just listening, just asking the question. And the, the, if somebody would have said but five minutes as they went out the door, every time they see and see my husband for anything, new wheelchair, new bed, new whatever, I don't even know they are coming. And they, if they would find me, and where are you, Leitrout? 
in the kitchen and how are you doing? How are you holding up? That is enough. It, it, it would make you feel, oh, yeah, I, I exist too. I, I, somebody is actually asking how I am. It doesn't have to go into an hour, but just every time. And how are you doing? I think that was one of the most useful things Absolutely. I was DP early on was the concept of um, empathy in small doses and that, in fact, people don't always expect you to completely solve what's an unsolvable problem. They expect you just to understand what's going on for them. And if they can see that you understand, that's often the support that they need at that point. Mm. And then to be able to do something is obviously a step further on from that. And not the Australian, how are you, mate? Because, you know, I don't answer to that at all <laughs> because it's a hello. Well, the response to that could only be uh, can't complain. Yeah, um, that's her. All right. You actually told them how you were. Or is, is, that, is, that, is that a risk? <laughs> I suppose going in as professionals or as peer professionals, sports, we are saying we are genuinely asking and genuinely interested in how you are. But Ethan, how are you doing? It's, it's different to how you are. How are you? It's, yeah, I'm, I'm all right. You but how are you doing? Effective. I'm going to having to say a little bit more. Hmm. I'd like to just add that um, me, uh, plenty of mental health professionals are trained um, to pr protect um, confidentiality and privacy uh, and it become and, and I think we can over apply it. It means that we we don't want to go into the kitchen and talk to somebody else because we think, oh, that's a clear breach of mm -hmm. the, the alliance, the therapeutic alliance, this the sanctity of that with my client. The way to get around that would be to say, just be really open and just talk them talk people through it and say, um, how well you go depends on many variables, including things like, your attitude and how hard you work at rehab and do you do goal setting. But actually, it actually depends a lot on support from others. So I would like to get to know anybody who, who you live with and I won't share anything about you. There's, there's certain things that are private, but maybe I could talk to them and connect with them and make sure they're doing okay. Is that all right? And then you've got permission and I think it's all legitimate. And and often, I've, and I think a lot of when I, if I've ever done that, a lot of the people I ask go, of course. Why are you even asking? <laughs> you know? yeah. And I know I get a bit too precious maybe about, so, well, it's not too precious. You have to watch your confidentiality. It's cr critical. But actually our clients are like, but go for it. Of course you would. Yeah. Well, there's one area that I was tippy towing around last week and Walter had gave me a good schooling on it, which was entirely appropriate, which was intimacy. And yes, so sex, not intimacy, <laughs> sex. <laughs> because intimacy, we can be intimate, you know, in so many ways. Um, but it can is be sex only one expression of intimacy? Are there other intimate connections we can have with people, even if to they're not sexual? Totally, totally. Mm -hmm. But sex is also a very important one. Yeah. And, and how do we do that? And we get shut down at the dinner table. Uh, that's how I broke all the rules all the time, lost friends over it because I wanted to talk about sex and nobody wanted to talk about sex. Um, not, not my friends. I embarrassed a lot of people and I shamed a lot of people. And, and I feel that's an important part in a therapeutic space to actually ask also a question. And how are you doing with intimacy? What's going on? You know? So again, to do that proactively, because it yeah, might, not, proactive. might not be offered, so we have to ask. Mm. And then what sort of, do people have any thoughts about uh, possible referral options? Conscious that we have an audience right across the country and that um, services are quite limited. Has anybody had any success with um, sex therapists or an approach to dealing with um, uh, sexual dysfunction or sexual concerns? Chris, what, what have you got? Can I can I, to answer that question, I think it, it's helpful to think about that as being maybe, you know, step four perhaps, and a clinician can only get there if they've had a really good frank conversation about it. Um, 
A lot of the audience might be aware of the PLICIT model, which is an acronym for ways that health professionals can bring up talking about um, sexual activity um, with anybody at all, but it's really helpful with people that are where their sexuality is affected by medicine. Just so that you know, there's a link um, for you in the resources folder. You can follow. There's a nice little article. It's quite short, very readable. And in brief, the P for implicit means this is our, our gateway. The way we get into this is to just ask permission and say, maybe using normalising language, like sex is a part of most people's lives and it can be quite important, but hard to do with your medical condition or your injury. Um, uh, I suggest we talk about it. Would you like to? So you're seeking permission to talk about it. But, but leaning heavily onto it and, and normalising, then LI, limited information, is the next step where you might start to do a little bit of education, let them know there are things that can be done then, specific suggestions is the SS, and then the IT implicit is intensive therapy. And that's where the referrals come in, which is why I wanted to jump in, Steve, and say you can. So it depends whether it's the male or the female or or, um, you know, if it, is it a same-sex relationship, et cetera, et cetera. And, find, and there might be a, there are me medical solutions to some problems or some really relationship solutions to problems that you don't need a medical intervention like a urologist or medicine or tablets. Um, so once you've got that permission to talk about it and you can identify the nature of the problem, then you'll know where to go for the referral. Great. All right. Thanks for that. There's been a number of questions coming up about um, chronic pain as an example of a disability, I suppose, but a disability that doesn't sort of stabilise and um, lead to sort of loss of function um, chronically. It's more about um, chronic pain as an ongoing problem. Does anybody have any thoughts about whether we have to alter our approach to mental health issues that arise. I mean, I know chronic pain would be considered a mental health issue, but are there any approaches that people have used in working with those who have the daily grind of chronic pain on top of their disability? And for me, as, as a gestalt therapist, it's uh, I, I look at pain very much as a psychological, uh, can, can be psychological, can be uh, chronic pain because of injuries and disabilities. And I have found that tapping has incredible results and uh, outcomes. And there's just a new paper, uh, a research paper being done from the Bond University on tapping and, and chronic pain. Uh, you might be interested to, I forgot to give you that resource, uh, but I can, yeah, you can look that up, Bond uh, tapping. And I'm sorry for my ignorance there, Walter, but what is that particular approach? Are you saying? Oh, tapping, tapping. Um, tapping. where where you 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 tap the acupuncture points, and you can tap on anything. Children are. are would be very useful to train them already at school because they that, that is a tool at hand at all times. They start off with tapping on their hand. Uh, we, we, you basically set up the session by asking how high is the pain on a on a uh, one to ten, ten being the worst. Give it a number. And then what are we going to tap on, on a headache, on, on anxiety, on your back pain? And then you start on your hand and you say, I am accepting my dot, dot, dot pain, whatever it is, completely and utterly. And then you start off with your, with your eyes here and you just, in your mind, re, um, uh, repeat the word. Um, headache, headache, and and you do it here, and you do it here, and you do it here, and here, and here, and here, and finish here. And There's something there in endorphin release, obviously, which is very practical. It's a very practical, uh, and and it's a practice you wanna you wanna support a person to get into, and they have that at hand, just like mindfulness, breathing, uh, exercises. What what can be an immediate tool for many things, and the more you practice it, 
um, the more benefits are being uh, reported. Mm. Well, Jordan, I think you're, you're correct when you say that a, a lot of people um, have trouble accepting it as a as a um, as an evidence based intervention. It's nice to know a study has been published. I think for every study that on that there would be sixty studies against it. Dem dem not against it. No, I don't know if anybody's found anything against it. But in support of. Um, uh, CBT, which is probably the most supported intervention, where the goal isn't to treat the pain necessarily, but to help people to change their relationship with their pain and be less distressed by it, less focused on it and less disabled by it. Um, and mindfulness can be embedded in the CBT. Um, that can be used across the age spectrum as well. So that would be the go-to, and it's really quite learnable and trainable. And anybody that's had exposure to CBT, you can learn how to apply that to chronic pain, mm -hmm. which can be quite disabling. Absolutely, mm -hmm. and ongoing and um, always changing. So look, thank you so much. Uh, we do need to move to the wrap up part, but there've been so many good questions. I want to ask just one more before we wrap up the session. Uh, and this is one that's come in from uh, Louise, Poe, I think it is, um, who's asking about people who have a disability that comes with a stigma, such as after follow, uh, following bariatric surgery and they carry the stigma of being overweight. Uh, but there are other things as well. She's also indicated the lung cancer, I guess, is um, maybe you have a respiratory disability, which people see as self-inflicted. Does that bring complexities to our approach to supporting people who have those so-called self-inflicted disabilities, which they're not? I think um, something to bear in mind when we're when we're talking about stigma and the impact that that makes on our mental health is that it's the work that we can do around that is on accepting ourselves. So when you're working with someone where there's the the stigma that they experience or the the impact of a stigma. Um, on their mental health is working through, well, how, how can I love myself? How can I accept myself? How can I be okay with who I am? Um, because what other people think of me is might, it might actually only be what I think other people think of me because, uh, um, the impact of a stigma is made so much worse by how we regard ourselves in the light of what we expect to be a stigma. Mm. Thanks so much for that comment. Glenn, I don't know if you had an amputation due to peripheral vascular disease from smoking. Do you think you'd be viewed differently? Uh, yes, I think you probably would actually. With, with talking with people, it, it, yes, it would seem self-inflicted where uh, mine, was a, mine was trauma, so totally different. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So what about a final comment from you? We'll go around the panel just in the last few minutes, just in one minute each. Glenn, any final thoughts you wanted to share with the group about the topic? Uh, thank you very much. You've opened my eyes up a lot. Um, uh, and I guess these sort of discussions, are, I, I tend to learn a little bit more about myself as well. So thank you, Steve. Oh, fabulous. Thanks for your contribution. Uh, Walter, what about you? Anything final you'd like to share with the group? I <clears throat> I think uh, the, what I would like to leave you with um, is that as every injury, doesn't matter what it is, is unique. Uh, there's no two spinal cord injuries the same. There's not two people who have taken the leg off the same. Uh, this, uh, as much also is each person carer, family member, different. And each time they step into my therapy room, I am seeing a, just a new person. I see them new each time they come to the session. And, and that is something uh, which is helping me to stay present and listen and feel what they are presenting with. That's what it's all about. So thanks so much for that comment. Katrina, a final, final word from you? 
Um, yeah, I think it's vital to keep in mind um, that in our response to people with a disability and the people around them, our role needs to be one of empowering and enabling rather than one of doing for. And so asking questions but being very okay with silence because sometimes questions won't be easy to answer and people need time to allow, people need time to allow themselves to get comfortable with the question you've asked before they can give an answer. Yep, absolutely. Thank you for that and for everything you've said tonight. Chris, the final word with you in your last minute. For everybody who wanted to come, obviously there's an interest already. My parting comments would be that if you haven't worked a lot in disability area, I believe you will have skills that you can use in this um, clinical field. Um, uh, straight away, you if you know you know how to empathise and validate people's emotions, it's absolutely critical, and that goes a long way. You know how to do it, build up a good case formulation so you can understand the problem and present it back to your, your client or the consumer, and then form a collaborative relationship where together you decide on what you want to change, emotions and behaviours. And you'll find a way to do that, we, even with the, the most um, remarkable injuries or illnesses or disabilities. So I'm glad that you're interested and that you're here. Fantastic. Thank you to you all. I'm now going to um, close things up, but before people leave us, uh, I will ask you just while I run through uh, a bit of an update about what's coming up and what's a very busy remainder of the year, uh, can you please complete the exit survey? Just click on the pie chart icon in the lower right corner of your screen next to the speech bubble. So while I'm talking, if you could do that, that'd be great. Or if you hang around, you'll get a pop-up message when the webcast ends. You'll also receive an email from MHPN with a link to the recording of the activity if you want to review anything or share with, with colleagues. Now, November is a frantic time. Next uh, webinar is the 7th of November at 7.15, which is from Comcare, looking at collaborating with the work to enable good work for your patient client. Um, we also have Breaking the Silence, the Black Rainbow Queer Robbery series on the 3rd of November at 1 o'clock. 7th of November is It's Never Too Late to Diagnose ADHD. And then, as you can see, there are emerging minds uh, supporting social and emotional well-being of children with higher weight uh, is on the 17th of November. And then on the 6th of December, uh, the Primary Healthcare Network series has non-medical supports and programs for older Australians. So keep an eye out for all these things and how you can register for these websites. So go to the MHPN page. And also to remind you that a podcast was released today called A Firefighter's Experience of PTSD, uh, which has been released recently. So that'll be a wonderful one to have a listen to. So MHPN networking program does support practitioners to meet and network with others from the local community. There are 350 across the country and around 30 have a focus on perinatal and or women's mental health because that's such an important topic. But they're listed on the slide and uh, MHPN will send more details about these in the post webinar email. If there isn't one in your area and you want to start one up, rip in and you can send an email to the uh, email address there, networks and um, that's a great way to connect with people in your area. So before we close, I would like to acknowledge the lived experience of um, people and carers who have lived with mental illness in the past and those who continue to live with mental illness in the present. Thank you so much to the panel tonight and to all of those online who have been such active uh, contributors. Thank you all for your participation and have a good evening. Goodbye. Thank you.